I'd love for you to open your Bibles if you have your Bibles, or you could turn it on your phones, or you could follow along with us on the screen to Judges 13, 24. And this is what the Bible begins to say. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And Samson, 14 verse 1, And Samson went down to Timnah in the Philistine country. And in Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And his father and his mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Let's, let's pray together. Father, tonight, Lord, God, as we, Lord, are in your house, in your presence, Lord, we expect miracles. Lord, we expect your word to do what your word always does, Lord, in every heart, Lord, that is open, that is willing to hear, to respond, and to receive. Lord, tonight we open our hearts, and we're willing, Lord. Now, Father, would you come and rescue every captive? Would you raise up everyone that's discouraged and fill everyone that's empty? And bless your people with great strength and great joy tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There are many things in this world that are set as a snare, just waiting to trap and to captivate any who are ignorant to their existence. This is why the Bible is so careful to warn us to be alert and to be sober-minded. For we all have an enemy, the devil, who is always looking for someone to devour and to trap and to destroy. Um, A.W. A. Tozer said this about the traps and the snares of our enemy, the devil, the enemy of our souls, he said this. He said, to be entirely safe from the devil's snares, the man or woman of God must be completely obedient to the word of the Lord. That we are safe or, or he or she is safe not when they read the signs or the warnings or the words of God, but when they obey them. Our protection is not simply being aware of the Word of God or even memorizing it, but it's in the obeying of the Word of God. But for any of us who have taken the following the Lord seriously, I think that we learn very, very quickly that to obey the Lord is to deny ourselves, which is always difficult to do. And for many of us tonight, if, if we're honest, of all the things that have succeeded in the past or may be currently attempting to ensnare us, the most effective traps are often the ones the devil deceives us into setting for ourselves. I want to share with you a message tonight titled, Samson's Warning. Samson's story Begins in Judges chapter 13 with, with just these um, eerie words, a, a, a pattern that maybe we've heard or seen before, maybe have even seen in our own lives. And the Bible begins to say in Judges 13, 1, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord gave them over into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Just like at one time, a people that had cried out to the Lord, a people suffering in oppression, suffering in darkness, suffering in agony, suffering in prisons, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord delivered them out of the hand of their enemies. Now the Lord, the Bible begins to say that there, something was happening in their, in their lives, in their practice, in their souls, that the Lord, just like the Lord delivered them out, 
that their ways were becoming evil in God's sight. And the Lord delivered them right back into the hand of oppression. And I know tonight that we are a New Testament people, that we, even as we heard from Pastor Patrick in, during the time of communion, that the Lord himself has atoned for our sins and that the Lord will no longer pour out his wrath on us when we fail or when we falter or when we sin, which is true. But I also, the word of God is true in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I don't believe this is speaking about an old covenant. I believe that today we are in the new covenant, but our new covenant terms are covenant, a covenant of faith. That yes, we might fail, we might falter, and the Lord forgives us, but when we no longer walk in faith, in courage, in confidence, in the Lord, that as we abandon faith, that we begin to find ourselves falling again, a prey to some of the old oppression and maybe some new oppression. And which is exactly what began to happen to God's people here in the time right before Samson was born, that God put them in the hand of a new enemy called the Philistines. And they were a unique people. They were an interesting people, not quite like the rest, not as aggressive, not as fearsome, not as, not as, as, as calculated in their attacks. They were a bit, a bit more civilized. They were a little bit more mannered. They were a little bit more impressive. They were technologically more advanced than most of the nations around them. And as opposed to coming to stomp them out and come, come to put them under their, their, their foot or under their thumb, they wanted to make friendship with them. They wanted the Israelites, they wanted God's people to, to be comfortable around them, to make peace with them. And so we begin to see a, a shift that as this group of people came around, this actually is what began to lead us. As God's people got comfortable with, with an enemy, God's people became comfortable with something that was, was trying to make friendship with them, that they found themselves in doing things that were displeasing to the Lord and found themselves under this type of oppression. And one particular quality of this people group, of this Philistine people group, it was, was what they did, what, how their, their policy towards God's people. They did not allow God's people to have any weapons. They, the, um, the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, 19, begins to describe this. It says that the Philistines allowed, uh, had, uh, and no blacksmith would be found in all of the land of Israel because the Philistines had said that Hebrews must not be allowed to make swords or spears. So on the day of battle, uh, not a sword or spear could be found in the hand of God's people. That part of this relationship, part of this oppression, part of this, 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 this dominance under which the God's people now existed was that everything seemed to be fine on the surface but in reality, they were completely defenseless. In reality, they, they could not rise up to go out and to fight the Lord's battles. And they could not come to serve God's purposes. But this was part of the environment that God's people were living in. And I believe what began to happen is God's people simply got too comfortable, too cozy in this environment. And they became ineffective. They became spiritually barren. So much so that everywhere we see God's people under oppression, we eventually hear that they cried out to the Lord and the Lord sent deliverance to them. But we hear no cry. We hear this is the kind of oppression. I believe this is exactly the type of oppression so many of God's people are experiencing today in the culture that we live in. Impressive. Seemingly trying to be friendly and polite, trying to be equal and trying to be, to just uh, to, to seek an equality and coexistence together. And yet as we simply yield to it, as we simply make peace with it, we can't help but find ourselves ineffective, barren, and defenseless. And so in this environment, we find that the Lord chose a certain man a man by the name of Noah, and he simply chose him because he had a barrenness problem. 
a symbol of the times, just like everybody else amongst God's people who had the spiritual condition of barrenness. God chose just a man, just an average man. This is what God does. God chooses somebody who is in trouble, somebody who is, is aware that there is no life possible in them and of themselves. And so God chooses him, and the angel of the Lord, in chapter 13, appears to Manoah's wife. And we see something really interesting, that as the angel of the Lord, which is actually the pre-incarnate Christ, if you study this out, there's a, when, when Manoah asks the angel of the Lord, what is your name? The angel says, how come you ask me my name, seeing that it is too wonderful? It's too wonderful for comprehension. This is the Lord. This is the Lord Jesus appearing in the middle of God's oppression. And they never even cried out. He appears to a barren situation. And he begins to speak to Manoah's wife. And what he does is begins to speak head on and begin to recognize the situation that they were in exactly how it is. The Lord Jesus says to this woman, he says, you are barren and you have no children. And I just want us tonight to consider just for a moment just how much in our culture and even we ourselves, how much energy we exert to try to evade the, our true condition. Right? How many voices we surround ourselves and how many things and products we reach to to try to hide our, our true condition just to make ourselves feel better. Maybe it's that we've given up that there might be a solution and that we're literally just trying to make an existence of, of feeling better about ourselves although our true situation is unchanged. And you see, the Lord Jesus is not afraid to come into our, our lives, to come into our situation and call things as they are because the Lord Jesus is the one that also has the power to begin to speak brand new life in a place of barrenness. And so just as he comes to, to, to prod at things that are not comfortable, prod at things that hurt, I don't know if anybody's barren or is not able to have kids in this place. That's a, that's a painful situation. But the Lord is able to come into our painful situations to put his finger upon it and to say, but I also speak life into that situation. And so he begins to speak to Manoah's wife, and not only is he bringing life, but he says, no, no, this is not just going to be an impossible life in an impossible place. I want this life, I'm going to make this life to go forth and to be a part of my deliverance. You see, just like so many of us, we are born again out of an impossible place. God came to us where we were dead in our sins and he reached right in there and he placed brand new life in us. But that life is not only for us, that life is to be a part of his plan of salvation and redemption that many other barren lives can become fruitful with new life, the life of Jesus. And so we begin to see that the, there is really just this one command that the Lord Jesus gives to this woman and to this family. That he begins to pronounce over this, this future supernatural life that is coming into this place. He begins to pronounce one command, one request, one assignment to obey, which is first to the mother and then really to the son. He says, your son will be a Nazarite from birth. And so he tells what, uh, the, the right of the Nazarites, it actually comes from, from the book of Numbers chapter 6. And what it means is any, anyone in the, in the Old Testament could take this, this vow of a Nazarite for a season. And what it meant was they would separate themselves from things that could make them unclean so that they could devote themselves wholeheartedly unto the Lord. And as they, they sought out from the Lord an answer to difficult things, they would dedicate themselves for a time. But the Lord Jesus pronounced over this brand new life out of an impossible place that this new life would be a Nazarite unto the Lord from birth to death, which is what I believe you and I are called out to be today, separated from, from the things of death, the things of the world, the things that defile, so that we can belong to Jesus. And the Lord pronounced that he would be a great deliverer in Israel. And so we go on and, and see that it be, the Lord begins to speak these things 
And really, it's a, it's a symbol that, of the condition of God's people. That while God's people were totally enmeshed with all of the things that defiled, that it corrupted their heart, and that the way out, the way to redemption and deliverance would be a return to a separation again unto the Lord. And so we find in our opening text that we read earlier, which begins to speak of the, the birth of this new life out of the impossible, a man named Samson. Maybe you've heard of him, a man that was given supernatural strength and ability by the Lord, a man that who could tear a lion to pieces with his bare hands, a man that could be charged and attacked by, by a thousand soldiers who would do him harm, and yet he was able to overcome all of them with a jawbone of a donkey. A man who ruled for, as a judge in Israel for 20 years. A man greatly empowered by the Spirit of God. It was God's Spirit that made him great and helped him to do all of these abilities. Just like the Holy Spirit comes upon us and is so faithful to do what he's promised. But right from the beginning of Samson's story, we begin to see a perplexing development in the way that he actually began to live out his life and calling. The very first thing that we begin to see the Bible records that he does is that he goes right into the forbidden territory, the land of the Philistines in the town of Timnah, and he sees something that he likes. He goes to hang out to the places he's not supposed to hang out, and he begins to fall in love with things that he's not supposed to fall in love with. And in fact, really, as we consider his entire life story, a picture, it's a, it's a privileged opportunity that we, we begin to see from God's perspective, right? The Lord sees our lives from this, this 30,000 foot view in totality, right? You and I, we're, we're just living from season to season, but God sees us as, as from beginning to end. And so he gives us this view of, a, of another person called, greatly called, greatly helped to see from a top view so maybe we can learn a few things. You re, I, I want us to realize tonight that really there are three key events that defined this man of God, this man greatly chose, that defined his entire life. And all three of these events were accompanied by a great presence of the Spirit of God, great victory over the enemy. And yet all three of these key events of Samson's life that defined his entire life was him chasing after temptation and the things that were supposed to be off limits to Samson. And the very first thing we see is he deliberately wants to marry uh, a Philistine woman, something his parents want to prohibit. And even on the way to this forbidden marriage, God is faithful to this man. A lion charges at him, and the Spirit of God shows up to empower him. He tears that lion. And as he's whole going to this wedding feast, really the original language says it wasn't just a feast, it was a beer fest. A man that was supposed to be a Nazarite separated from, from drinking alcohol is what the, that, that vow of a Nazarite was. That already from the beginning, Samson was wholeheartedly embracing the very things he was supposed to abstain from his entire life to sustain this great call to deliverance and to a walk with the Lord. Then the second thing that we begin to see, a second, all of these, these are the events around which his entire life happen as it's recorded in the Bible. The second is a one night stand with a prostitute in the city of Gaza, yet again with a Philistine woman. And yet with his ability and great strength and that confidence that he's gained from being met by the Lord over and over as he had been before, he knows that he might be captured by his enemy in this uncompromising situation. And so he gets up at just the right time to evade the captures. And so he goes to a gate of the city that is locked and through the Spirit of God once again, testing, trying the patience of God. He simply rips up this gate, carries it on his shoulder, and goes off and evades the attack. And finally, I think this is the, the, the story that's, that, that is famous about Samson's life. It was his, his, his relationship, in, uh, an open and unashamed relationship, yet again, with a Philistine woman named Delilah, 
to whom the Bible begins to tell us that he really fell in love with her. That, that after pursuing and playing these games with temptation and the things that are unclean, by testing and trying the patience of God and, and, and seeing that God still showed up for him, that finally he began to see, not see, he began to grow blind to what was so obvious right before him. Delilah famously was, was, was hired by the Philistine rulers who were after to destroy Samson and was asked to find out the secret of his strength. The secret of his strength was the Lord abiding in his life. The secret of his strength was that he was supposed to be devoted and at least in very, very limited part by, by not cutting his hair. He still uh, kept and maintained uh, at the very least an outward expression of that devotion. And even with that small expression of devotion, there was still great power in his life. But a time was coming where these games were the things that he knew would destroy everybody else. But his arrogance, his cockiness, his self-reliance on the very things that God was giving him and doing in him and for him made him blind to continue to pursue these things. And so we see Delilah pursuing, taunting, asking Samson, what is your strength? Tell me. And Samson toying and playing with danger, with fire, and telling her four times a lie, and yet on the final time. The Bible begins to say in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatever you sow, you will reap. Your consequence will find you out even if you're strong and backed up by the Spirit of God like Samson was. And so we see these games that Samson thought he was strong enough to maintain, that he was able to play both sides, walking and following Jesus and loving the things of this world. That finally Delilah was able to, to get him at the right place, at the right moment. And the Bible says that he spoke all his heart to her. That he finally gave way and gave in, and whatever, whatever vestiges of devotion to the Lord, whatever parts of his heart belong to the Lord still that allowed God to, to maintain faithfulness to him, that he gave, finally gave all of that to Delilah, and the Bible says that he fell asleep on her lap. What a picture. Fell asleep on the lap of temptation, the very thing that he knew had the power to destroy him, and while he slept, his, his locks of hair were cut off. And the Bible says that when Delilah taunted him and mocked him and said, the Philistines are here, rise up to defend yourself, that Samson did not know that the Lord had left him. And that he got up as before to fight off his enemies, that he, his strength had departed from Samson. And the man that was greatly chosen and greatly empowered and greatly called, a man to whom the Lord was greatly faithful, who played the Lord, finally met his demise that he thought would never come. And so he was blinded by the Philistines who gouged out his eyes. He was shackled with bronze shackles and put in a prison to be taken out and mocked at the most opportune times and Philistine feast. And this became the, the, the demise and the end of this man of God. But the Bible doesn't end his account there. You see, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith, the chapter of the men and women of God that did end up doing great works of faith, faith and won mighty exploits for the Lord, not men and women that were great in their own strength, but men and women who found the great strength of the Lord through faith who had come to him and cried out to him. There in that chapter, the hall of faith, we see the mention of Samson. And you and I might wonder, how come, how come that, we, that we see this man who was living this contradiction, living this compromise, who was playing the Lord and found his end and his demise, how come he's mentioned in this hall of faith? And I want to just suggest to you 
tonight. That something must have happened at that place of being met with consequences that the Bible says that the, the, one of the last verses of this account with Delilah, it says, and after his hair was cut off and he was put in prison, that his hair began to grow back, signifying that the mercies of God still return and come to those who greatly fall and falter. <laughs> Praise God. And so tonight, I, wanna, I want us to consider these three warnings Three lessons that Samson learned at the very end. And for tonight, for us to consider that we can learn these lessons, we can learn the lessons of a man that paid a high price to learn these, we can learn them now and willingly yield ourselves in devotion and in separation and in holiness to the Lord and be a part of that great salvation that he's prepared to deliver through us that we might not be people who are a warning, but we might be a people who are a testimony tonight. And so I want us to consider lesson number one as we get ready, which is holiness is not just for show. I want to read you a quote from John Wesley. My one aim in life is to secure personal holiness. For without being holy myself, I cannot promote real holiness in others. You see, Samson had this unique ability that maybe we sometimes have, but not always, that he thought that he might be able to maintain an outward show of devotion to the Lord, of separation to the Lord, an outward show, that he thought that there are things that we can do and I, uh, uh, that, that the Lord would be content with and that I could be content with. And isn't that a part of the culture in which we live in today, even in the Western Christianity, that we go to such, such extreme lengths to show, uh, to, 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 uh, to make a show of our separation from the world. That we've become so defined as a people that are other, that we're not like the, we, what we used to be. We're not like the, 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 the sinners out there that live in the world in sin, in perversion, in their lost ways. And we make so much show, but it's a show for show's sake so often because it doesn't always go deeper than just an outward expression. You see, Samson was content to live with just one of the three requirements that he was called to live as a Nazarite. Yes, he did do not cut his hair as he was supposed to. That's the, the expression of outward show. But he was also supposed to not partake in things that are not clean. He was not supposed to enjoy entertainment in things that would defile him. That the things that would come and, and live inside the place where the Lord himself was to live. And so we see in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16, starting in verse 16 down to 8. And this is what the Apostle Paul begins to say. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk with them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And to touch no unclean thing and then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you. And you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 4, begins to say, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, in that opening text that we read in chapter 14, verse 4, the Bible says that even Samson's parents did not know that the Lord was behind this contradiction and Samson's life. And I just want to present to you this, just this one idea. You see, Samson, and even us, as we read this text, to a certain point in this text, we might say, well, maybe the Lord does have another standard for some people. How, how is it that the Lord would allow somebody to, to live this double life and yet show up for them and fight off their enemies? And show up for them in great way and do great things for them and allow somebody to judge God's people for 20 years? 
And what, what we might be tempted to believe, even for ourselves, that when we see God continue to show up in us and through us and even bless somebody and reach somebody, when we know that we have compromised our ways, that we might be tempted like Samson to believe, well, maybe we are special. Maybe there is another way that's possible that, you know, maybe not a narrow path, but maybe a wider path because God knows my needs, that there are just some things that God knows that I just must have, which is what Samson said to his, his father about this Philistine woman. And I want us to consider tonight, what are some of those things that we have made peace with, that we've said even to the Lord and to our heart, Lord, you know what? I see that you're blessing me, so I'm just not going to worry about this thing anymore. Because, Lord, I guess you know, just like I do, there are just some things that are just too much to give up, and you understand, Lord. And we begin to see how the Lord's patience became an opportunity for the enemy to deceive Samson to create his own trap. That through his own great strength, he built his own trap in which he was eventually caught and snared. I want us to consider lesson number two tonight, which is a lack of devotion is just what temptation ordered. Our lack of devotion to the Lord, our lack of total devotion of the Lord is the exact place where temptation loves to come in, loves to live, loves to abide. It's the perfect condition and the perfect environment where the enemy comes and gets the best of us. I want us just to consider for a moment that Samson was to be a Nazarite, separated, holy, but not just separated, he was supposed to be separated unto the Lord. That we're not just to shun the things of this world. We're not just to be contented with half of the process that we've made such a, a great, great ex ex exercise of our, of our resistance, of a great exercise of our efforts to be separate. But we forget that we are to create space for a devotion and a relationship and an experience of Jesus. I, was, uh, I heard about an article over the weekend about this couple in Queens, this weekend, uh, a couple in Queens that bought and renovated uh, a property they wanted to rent out. And between the time that they, that they finished the renovations and when they were able to get some tenants to move in, the house sat vacant and unoccupied. And on the day that the owners and the new tenants came to, to move into the home, they found that the locks were changed and that somebody else was living in the house. And so in the moment, in the time, in the period of time where something was left unoccupied, a home was left unoccupied, that these squatters easily found their ways in and they changed the locks. And so the article, the reason why the article, I think, made the, the news is that, that uh, the, the owners thought that they would take things into their own hands. They, they called the police, and the police had to follow squatters' rights laws, and they had to go through the courts. And so the owners of the house decided to take things into their own hands, and so they waited for the owners to leave the home, at which eventually they had to leave to get food or whatever they had to leave. And then the owners went in, and they changed the locks back to try to lock out the squatters. Little did the owners realize that in just a few days, they would be order, uh, 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 served a court notice because they were being sued by the squatters that were squatting in their house. And so the moral of the story tonight, if you leave something unoccupied, there's such a phrase that I think we all know, that nature abhors a vacuum. That there are some things that exist in such a pressurized environment that if something is, is, is vacated and left unoccupied by what belongs there, there are many things just waiting to find their way into that place. And if we are not separated from so many things to be devoted unto the Lord, that we will be devoted to something else, which is exactly what Samson did in that free time that he had hanging out in Philistine territory. And finally, I want to close with a third point. Greatest victories can still come even after the greatest of failures. I believe tonight... One of the greatest realities of this man's story 
And even for some, some of us in this place or listening online, there are some failures that take everything. Samson's strength was gone. The presence of the Lord seemed to be gone in his life. Samson's eyesight was gone. And not only was he tightly held in prison and in bondage, he was paraded as a display, as a mockery of what he once had. That is a dark place to live. But it's not too dark for the Lord to show up in. And we begin to see that in that place, up until now, there was no mention of a devotion to the Lord. There was no mention of anyone crying to the Lord in the whole land of Israel uh, who was living under this great oppression. And finally, even though it was through great failure, finally a man cried out to the Lord and he was greatly met. I believe the reason why Samson made it into the hall of faith is because finally after he cried out in repentance and in surrender and turned his heart wholeheartedly in devotion to the Lord, again faith was arise, arisen in his heart and that he could finally stretch out his arms. A man who had once lived for his own pleasure and said, Lord, let me die that the people of God could be delivered. Let me die for the sake of others. Let me be done dead to myself so that others could be free. And the Bible begins to say that a man who greatly failed, the greatest failure of his life, experienced the greatest victories of his life in his death more than in his entire lifetime. And tonight as we get ready to close, I want us to consider another man who stretched out his arms to give his life so that others could be free. A man who was arrested, beaten, and tried for sins, many, many, many sins, and atrocities, compromises, double lives, none of which were his, but instead they were ours. And as Jesus stretched out his arms on a Roman cross, that he began to allow our, each and every one of our failures where we should have known better. Each of our, our blindness and ignorance to our own yielding and building of these traps through the deceptions of the enemy in which we eventually got caught. For all of these trespasses, that stand against us for them to be nailed with the nails that went through his cross. And as he cried out to the Father, he says, Lord, forgive them for they might not know what they do. Maybe they did know what they do. But Lord, forgive them and consider my obedience and my death as a ransom for many. And tonight in this place, as we all just get, um, can we all stand in this place as we get ready to close out? If you're that person, like Samson found himself, you're living in a defenseless situation, you feel that your life is barren, you feel that you are blinded, unable to be free, living as a mockery, haunted by your failures, that tonight, like so many others in this place, that you could cry out like Samson. You could cry out for a true and deep deliverance. And God in His mercy would will come to meet you even in some of the consequences of things that you chose for yourself and provide grace and strength and His presence and healing. But before you can experience all of that and begin to cry out, you must realize that the Bible says in John chapter 3 is that you must be born again. That if you begin to cry out to Him, that He must become your Lord and your Savior 
And we could do that tonight. And it's as simple as A, B, and C. As we know tonight that A stands for admit. That it always starts with this first step of recognizing our true condition. True where we are truly stuck. Where we truly need a redeemer and a savior that we cannot save ourselves. B stands for believe that you and I must believe tonight that God chose to go on that cross for you and I. God willingly saw you and loved you and decided deliberately to die on that cross for you and I. You must believe that. And C stands for because of all of that you must now choose to confess him, make him your Lord your Savior, your God, the one that would order and be the one that you are devoted, order all your steps, the one that you give your greatest devotion and allegiance to. And so tonight, if you are in this place and you want that deliverance for which Jesus died and you want that brand new life that is impossible unless God does something, you can have that by turning to the Lord by calling on his name. And you could be, I'm going to pray the, the born again prayer in just a few moments. And you could be included in this prayer and you can make your own plea to our Lord and he can become your Lord, your Savior, your Deliverer. And I'm going to pray this prayer in a few moments. And if you are in this place and you know this is you tonight, and you don't want to leave this place to return to your old life, to your own ways. But you want to be born again and have this new life in Jesus Christ. I want you to be unashamed and just raise your hand like so many of us have done before. Unashamed, raise your hand all over this place to receive Jesus, the lover and the savior of your soul and your life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Praise God. So why don't we pray this prayer together, and all of you that have raised your hands, you can, be, you can pray this as, uh, as well. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so that I could live again. And you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Right now, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sins to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. Oh, the Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. We, we, we celebrate your decision. We celebrate your, your reaching out to the Lord tonight. If you made that decision, we actually we, we want to invite you to text the word DECIDED to 51000. And it'll be somebody from our team will reach out just with some, some next steps. We won't bother you. But for everyone else in this place tonight, as we get ready to close out, we're going to worship in a little bit. But if God is speaking to you tonight, if God is speaking to you about this double life that you've been fooling yourself about. God is speaking to you about this invitation that he's made to all of us to, to truly separate and come out and be separate from the death that we were a part of before in which we used to drown and die, to be devoted entirely to new life in Jesus. Maybe you've forgotten that God died to give you a brand new life and you need to be refreshed. Maybe tonight you're reeling from the consequences of your failure and you simply need to cry out. We want to make an altar here tonight, an altar where we can pray together and call upon the Lord. Would you make your way down? Would you make your way down to, to call on the Lord? Or if you just need to be refreshed in Him tonight because you're going through a dry season and you just want to respond to His presence tonight. We're going to open the altars just for a few moments. And I'm going to come back and pray with us in a moment.